So hi and welcome everybody. Welcome back to the wireless communication, wireless security course. So uh, now we continue talking about the security that exists in the current available wireless networks, including Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, WiMAX, LTE, 5G, and so on. We need basically to talk about those technologies briefly and then discuss their key advantages, key properties of each of these technologies, and then mention what approaches, what algorithms and methods are being used to secure the, the, to secure the communication and secure the data transmission in such a way we meet the security requirements. We fulfill the security requirements in terms of authenticity, confidentiality, and integrity, privacy, and availability. So let's divide those networks into two types. The first type is called uh, Wireless Personal Area Network, WP, WBAN. The second type, Wireless Local Area Network, Wireless LAN. And the third type, wireless man, uh, wireless metropolitan area networks. So what are the characteristics of these networks? So if we look at wireless personal area networks, we have a coverage area of about 100 meter. We have data rate of about 2 megabit per second. And an example of technology that, belong, that belongs to this domain is Bluetooth. ZigBee as well, and uh, some other technologies. So when we talk about wireless band, is the, 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 this is the this is the domain. Uh, within wireless band, there is even one that's smaller than this. We call it the wearable, uh, the communication for wearable devices, or like near field communication for uh, for payments, for credit card payments for uh, you know those tags that are attached to items you buy them from the market those they use near field communication as well and rfid sorry rfid uh, so rfid and near field communication those are even smaller much smaller than uh, the wireless band because the data rate is sometimes in kilobit per kilobyte per second and the range is less than even one meter and example of such technology RFID tag used in tags and patches and so on. Uh, now the second type is wireless LAN. Wireless LAN, example of a technology that uses wireless LAN is Wi-Fi. The range of it is up to 250 to 300, sometimes 500 meter, but it's less than half kilometer. Uh, so the range is bigger than the range of wi wireless band, and the data rate can go up to 300 mega, sometimes more than this or less than this, but in this range. And uh, the security here, the security procedure is different and more uh, more difficult than the security available at wireless band. And then when uh, when we extend the range a little bit more, and become beyond half kilometer, let's say for 10, 10 kilometer, 5 kilometer, 2 kilometer, then we are talking about wireless metropolitan area network. So example of the of such networks is WiMAX, LTE, 3G, 2G, GSM, and 5G even. 5G belongs to this type of, net, of wireless networks. And the data rate can go up to gigabit per second with 5G 10 gigabit per second and above. So those are those are the main three types of wireless networks that we will be discussing their security. So we let's start with the Bluetooth. With the Bluetooth as an example of a wireless personal area network. So in Bluetooth, what do we have in Bluetooth? How do how do how do we achieve authentication? in Bluetooth communication and, and confidential transmission. So as you can see, when you look at the uh, left-hand side figure, we have uh, 
a device unit A and another device we call unit B. And unit B, we name it claimant, and unit A, we name it verifier. And in, in here, the two devices want to authenticate, the, dev the device A wants to authenticate device B. So here, it's one one-way authentication. As you can see, only uh, we, we are showing here the process in which device A only authenticates device B. So what happens here? We First of all, uh, the claimant, device B, establish a connection with device A, link establishment request. Then after, uh, after this process, there is a link key exchange a link that's established between unit A and unit B to share a key, secret key. And usually they use some algorithm that's properly designed and exclusively used to share these keys over a public channel secretly. And the length of this key is usually uh, low, not that like it's the length of this is not that huge like uh, it's in less than sometimes 100 bits or 200 bits. After they exchange the key, the claimant device B requests and sends an authentication request to device device A. And the way it sends before it sends it before device A sends this authentication request, device A take some information he has, which is the key, and use it to sign something to generate uh, some information and send it to device A. Now, device A does not need to decrypt this request or decode it or anything, just takes it as is, store it, and then he generate its own and compare the received one with the existing one. If they match, then he sends a random number, okay, random number. The unit, the device B uses this number to generate, to generate a message that he again sends it to unit, device A, and then from the response that device A gets from device B, decides whether the device that's requesting an authentication with me is valid or not based on whether it has the key or not, because already they share the key among each other. So this is the process of authentication. So if we if we want to think about the problems of this method, so what will come to your mind? First, it's lengthy process. Yes, it there are too many signals going forth and back to authenticate your device. It takes time and therefore it causes delay. And the length of the key uh, is not that large. It's like, I mean, it's in in less than 100 bits or 200 bits, so the security is not that strong. Now, when you look at the uh, right-hand side, this figure shows you the process of the authentication. So the left-hand side shows you the exchange of messages and the exchange of uh, Control, uh, control messages that get transferred between the two users. And the figure on the right hand side shows you the process, the algorithm, how it works. The authentication starts, then it just comes to the point where it needs to decide whether the device is trusted or not. If yes, authentication okay. If no, uh, it requests authorization. If no, authorization fails. If yes, creation of trust allowed. Yes, creation of trust, no, authorization, okay. So th this shows you that we, we, we don't only uh, depend in the Bluetooth security, we not just depend on the authentication, but also there is an authorization process. So what's the authorization? Authorization, Okay, you authenticated this device, so this is a legit device. This is okay. I mean, he's a valid device. He wants to connect with me. I authenticated him. I know this device. I know this guy. But 
Should I authorize him to access all the services? Should I authorize him to use all the available things that this connection provides? This is what authorization means. The ability to use all the services that are available. Okay, you connected to my Wi-Fi, but should I allow you to use all the websites? Should I allow you to use all the services? Should I allow you to print from all the printers? So this is what authorization, the ability to use the service. For example, in mobile networks, the authorization means that you already have enough credit in your phone, in your SIM card, so that you can make calls. Okay, I authenticated you. You are a legit, valid, authentic device. That's fine. But should I allow you to call? Let's check his credit card. Let's check his balance. His balance is below zero. Then why should I authorize him? The service is rejected. So the provider will not allow you to even make a call. Why? Because you are not all being authorized. Although you are not trying to make any like you are authentic and this and that. So authorization is related to services. That I'm explaining it because I don't want you to get confused between this word authorization and authentication. Authentication is the process of verifying and validating that a certain device is legit, he is authentic, he is not trying to fake us, he is not trying, trying to pretend somebody else. Uh, he's not using somebody else's identity and all these uh, all these issues that are related to spoofing. And authentic authorization is related to granting services for the device. So this is the so this is the main the main security approach that's being used in Bluetooth. What about the encryption? The encryption they use really very simple encryption algorithm. That's based on ciphering. What does ciphering means? You just change flip. I mean, you have a mapping table and you just say if X comes, replace it with Y. If Z comes, replace it with X. If uh, U come, replace it with O. If uh, D comes, replace it with A. It's just a mapping, ciphering. And there is a, a stronger ciphering than this, which is permutation and puncturing. But all these techniques are weak, I mean. And the reason why they are not pushing hard on the security of Bluetooth, because the range is the range of the security, the range of the communication is not that large, not that uh, it's it's in the, in in less than 100 meter, and most of the wi wi most of the Bluetooth devices, like your keyboard, like your uh, headphone handset, or mouse or any of the, uh, any of these devices they even have a communication range less than 10 meters sometimes so no i usually it's very when there is no communication range uh, which is not that not that wide then the security will not be so critical. The security becomes critical when there is a possibility for someone to be between the transmitter and receiver and you don't see him. When there is a possibility that someone can really hear your communication. But if you are in a range of 10 meters, you are in full control of your communication almost. So that's why the security in the Bluetooth does not need to be so strong and that's why the encryption is not even uh, using an RSA or those complex complex encryption algorithm. So now, having explained the security in Bluetooth, let's go and explain the security in Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi, we will talk about the authentication, the protocol used for authentication, and the one used for confidentiality. So the first one is web. Uh, th this is this is the, the the most basic one, and this was the first protocol proposed to be used for uh, for the for authentication purposes in Wi-Fi networks. And how it works uh, is the following: the, the you have the client device and the access point, and here the client device request uh, sends an authentication message to the access point. The access point sends a challenge 
uh, to the device and this challenge is usually random a random text plain text then the device uh, encrypt and send back to the access point and then the access point decide whether it's uh, whether it's valid or not and usually this process uh, to, to make it clearer for you uh, in Wi-Fi, when when you want to connect with the Wi-Fi access point, basically you have you click on the on the signal uh, on the signal uh, of the Wi-Fi, and when you want to enter or connect with the Wi-Fi, it just tells you uh, enter a password. And this basically the password. Think of it like the shared key between the access point and the client. And this key uh, is 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 already shared ahead of time. Who shared this key with you? The person who came to your home to install the ex Wi-Fi access point the router when when you asked for an internet service from the internet service provider. He just came to you, programmed the router for you, and told you this is your this is your uh, password for the network. Don't forget it. And he in the in the access point at the time when he programmed it, he 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 wrote the password there in the database. So it's it's to think of it as like the key. Uh, it's related to the key, and then this is the, based on this you, you you when you when the device sends a request, the access point uh, sends a plain text, and wants the device to encrypt this text. If the encryption is done using the same key as the key that the access point has, then authentication will be fine, and it will and it will grant the user access to the internet. Otherwise, it will not. Now, as you can see, this is different from Bluetooth authentication. In Bluetooth authentication, we have uh, two more steps. We have link. Uh, we have link key exchange. There is an exchange process. Why is that? Because you don't have like we don't have the case of Wi-Fi. So basically, in Bluetooth as well, you are the the the. For example, if you want to connect your mouse with the with your laptop, most of the cases you don't even have you don't even need a password. Uh, but like sometimes. Sometimes there is so the, the process of authentication and sharing the key is embedded in the case of Bluetooth, unlike the case of Wi-Fi. Now this is for the authentication. What about for the encryption and for achieving confidentiality? So for that, for that to happen, you have as you can see here, you have again you have web, and this is used for security, and for this we we need to explain the diagram here so we you, you have the plain text this is what you want to send and you have an integrity algorithm this integrity algorithm basically uh, generates random data from the plain text that gets into it and it gives an output this output is called icv integrity check value so this integrity check value, this here, right here, think of it like the cyclic redundancy check in communication system. For those of you who know communication very well, when you want to send a packet, at the end of the packet, you have a small box here. We call it cyclic redundancy check. In communication, we use this box. We use this box, this cyclic redundancy check, to detect if there are any error in the data packet we sent or we received or not. I mean, when you send it to the receiver, the receiver wants to check that that is the packet uh, having any errors in it or it's error free. How does the receiver do that? He just takes this back, this data, and he he has an algorithm that generates a sequence called the cyclic redundancy check sequence, 
when the method operates on this data gives a, a CRC block, then the receiver compare this CRC block with the CRC block that receives from the transmitter. If they match, if they are the same, then there are no errors. And why do we need this? Because the channel usually uh, acts like a hacker. The channel, because of the fading, changes the value of the bits. You send zero, you receive it one. So the receiver needs to know this because if it's wrong, I need the transmitter to resend the packet again. Otherwise, I will not be able to decode my packet successfully. So in communication, this CRC is used for detecting if there are any errors. We use similar method, but for what? For verification purposes, for integrity check value that I, I, I sent this information and I'm going to send it to the receiver. And I want to make sure that nobody manipulates this message while it's being transferred over the network. And uh, so it's for integrity validation. And it can be used as, as a signature as well. So this is it. And here you, ha you concatenate. What's this concatenation process? You have plain text, you encrypted it, and you put it here. Yes, this is kind of packet. And then the, the output of the integrity algorithm, you put it at the end of the packet, just like how CRC is being added to the packet that you want to send to the receiver. And then after that, you have a packet with CRC, okay? And then uh, you need to, to encrypt this. How do you encrypt this? You encrypt it with the web key. This web key is, uh, is used, which is kind, the length of this web key is about 100 bits used as a seed to generate random data that has the same length as the data you want to send. Okay? Just like the data you want to send. You And what do you do then? You XOR the, 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 the data here, the data you got, you, you, you have here with integrity with CRC or ICV with the key with the encryption key you have at the upper side. And then the end result will be cipher text. This is what you will send to your Wi-Fi. And the same when Wi-Fi wants, wants to talk to the receiver. So this basically the web security. So what's the main, uh, what's the key? Uh, the, okay, we understand how it works and this, but why web is no longer used, I mean. So the, the algorithm here uses a simple reverse cipher for algorithm operating with the aid of the pre-shared web key of 40 bits. See here even says that the web key 40 bits, not even 100. And this is shared ahead of the time and just simple ciphering. And here there is a note that says that web fails to protect the information against replay attacks and forgery. And the main reason for this mainly because of the uh, short key length and uh, the simple encryption algorithm that's being used to protect the data. Now, uh, now although WIP was the first security protocol to be proposed to secure Wi-Fi, nowadays it's no longer being used because WIP has been shown to be a relatively weak security protocol having numerous flaws. It can be cracked in a few minutes using a basic laptop computers. The main reason for this is the key length and the non-sophisticated encryption algorithm. So this is done. This is anybody, if I give a homework for you here, hack, hack a Wi-Fi using web, it will be super easy for you. Just search on Google. Uh, programs and software used to hack Wi-Fi networks using uh, that uses web protocol. Super easy program. You run it, automatically finds the password and crack it. So what can we do then to solve this problem? The security, the security standard. They used an advanced version of this called Wi-Fi protected access. 
this is the second protocol that's used an update after web. So what's special about this? The main advantage of web uh, of uh, Wi-Fi protected access WPA over web is that Wi-Fi protected access employs more powerful data encryption referred to as the temporal key integrity protocol. You remember we said in the previous slide the main problem was in the encryption method and in the key link. Here the encryption method gets more sophisticated temporal temporal key not you don't you don't just keep using the same key forever which is assisted by a message integrity check invoked for the sake of protecting the data integrity and confidentiality of wireless network and the way it works as as follows you have the plain text and you have the source and destination address and you have the key the message integrity key you have your message fragmented plain text and you have your key in the upper side and this key is temporal can be updated and it has two phases and then there is here the encryption algorithm which is basically inherited from web but the the, the improvement has been on the message integrity check and the encryption uh, the key used for encryption gets uh, it gets uh, it actually became longer and uh, includes two phases which make which makes it really difficult for the hacker to crack it but i'm not saying uh, that it's difficult for the expert hackers i mean it's not common among the normal users but there are ways of even cracking this as well but most of the wi-fi access point right now are using uh, this protocol wi-fi protected access and some of them used uh, wi-fi protected access 2 with 2 which is an improved version of this where they use longer key there is a difference between wi-fi protected access used in the home in the home and the one used in the uh, enterprises and companies and universities in companies and universities, it's not sufficient only to enter the key of the password. So you, 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 when you click here and you, you click on the signal and you connect with it and you put the password and then after that you go to the browser, which is the second phase, phase of authentication. And this is in, for each and every individual in the, author, in the enterprise, they give him username and password to access the authentication server. So the Wi-Fi network in the in a company has its own authentication server, which is not the case, which is not the case for a Wi-Fi home network. So this is the Wi-Fi security basically. And now having talked about Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, let's talk about WiMAX security. WiMAX, WiMAX security is stronger than Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and the reason for that it uses really sophisticated encryption methods like RSA based authentication process, signature certificates and the, the, the so RSA, it uses basically two authentication approaches. RSA based on authentication which is really strong and on top of that it uses EAS encapsulation and uh, this encapsulation and decapsulation is basically also related to authentication. So as you can see you have in the find Mac the security is applied at the Mac security sub layer and the, the procedure here the security procedure is much more complex than the security used in Wi-Fi. So you have here in, in part A, you have the WiMAX protocol stack. You have physical layer, security sublayer, common part sublayers, and service specific convergence sublayer. This is the protocol stack. Think of it like the OSI layers in computer network. And then you have the, you have the security sublayer specification here in this uh, in the bottom side those are all related to 
encryption and authentication, message authentication processing, control message processing, traffic data encryption, authentication processing, PKM control management, RSA authentication, SA control, EAP encapsulation. All of these are like many, many security algorithms are used together in order to improve the security of the Wi-Fi, of the WiMAX network. Now, one might ask why, why the security of Wi-Fi was not that complex, I mean, compared to WiMAX. And why didn't we see this in Bluetooth even? And the simple answer is this, the, the bigger the coverage range of your wireless network, the more security threats can exist in the network. And those security threats, you cannot see them sometimes. Therefore, when, when, the, when, when the coverage increase, when the coverage of the network increases, the security requirements increases, and therefore you need to improve your security to the highest level possible. Like, it's not simple to add just RSA or another authentication algorithm or another complex encryption method because it really costs the network resources, delay, complexity, and money as well. So usually, they, they don't prefer to use uh, too much security if it's not necessary because too much security will degrade the other performance metrics and will cause some trade-off to your network. So now looking at the right hand side here in the authentication process, the RSA based authentication, you have you have the AAA server, which is authentication, authorization, accounting server. So here this is the server that's responsible for the authentication and authorization and accounting process. And you have a certificate authority that generates and distributes certificates. Those certificates, think of them that a document that contains the public and private key, okay? The public and the private key of the pay station, of the users, of everything, everything is there. So this node must be trusted. And there, the job of this node is very sensitive and very critical. And now each node will have its own private and key, uh, private, key uh, private key and public key. In this case, since each node will have its own keys, then the base station will be able to authenticate the user and the user will be able to authenticate the base station. So what's the difference here with respect to Wi-Fi? You have downlink and uplink authentication, but there you just have one authentication. Just the Wi-Fi access point wants to authenticate the receiver. But the receiver, does the receiver authenticate the access point in the Wi-Fi? No. So can you, can you, can you conduct uh, access point in person uh, spoofing attack in the Wi-Fi? Yes, you can. In WiMAX, difficult. But in Wi-Fi, because the authentication just in one way, I can I can bring a new a new Wi-Fi and claim to be the right Wi-Fi and let the user access to my Wi-Fi instead of accessing the original home Wi-Fi network. So here, to avoid this problem, they have this two authentication, downlink and doublink. So the, y, the WiMAX security here, in order to guarantee the confidentiality of the transmission, WiMAX considers the employment of the advanced encryption standard. So for confidentiality, WiMAX uses advanced encryption standard, and this uses shared key between the transmitter and receiver. For authentication purposes, WiMAX uses RSA algorithm and EA, EAP algorithm as well to authentication process. So, 
So here is the procedure of the confidentiality process after the authentication is finished. The authentication I told you, this is the first authentication is RSA-based authentication. This is the second authentication, which is EAP-based authentication. And on top of that, they use the advanced encryption standard after the authentication process finishes. They use the advanced encryption standard to encrypt the data. So it's very complex, the security here. It's not easy for a hacker to get in. Although WiMAX networks are not available anymore, they are not adapted, uh, they are being replaced by LTE, but usually, now we will go to LTE, LTE security has kind of similar, similar security strengths. So it uses symmetric, here WiMAX uses symmetric encryption and uh, asymmetric authentication protocols. Now, uh, moving forward, we have the LTE network, which is, we call it the 4G network. LTE is the commercial name, 4G is the technical name. And here, if you look at the network, it's, it, it consists of two parts, the radio part and the core part, the evolved packet part, the, the evolved packet core, which is the you know the network part, the devices, the servers, the switches, the, the home the home center, the mobility center, those they communicate with each other and talk with each other. And you have the radio part. The radio part is the part that interfaces the wireless transmission. And uh, we, when we say wireless security, we care about the, radio, the RAN part, the radio access network part. And what, what unique thing here you have in LTE? In LTE, they introduced a new, two new types of technologies. They have the relay, the relay technology, which is used to amplify the signal. If a user is not able to reach the base, to reach the base station, there is a relay on the way that gets the signal and strengthen it and then send it back to the, send it, amplify it and send it to the base station and vice versa as well. If the base station is not able to reach the receiver and there is a relay in between, the base station signal, which is captured by the relay, gets decoded, amplified, and then strengthened and uh, re-forwarded to the user equipment. So, and we have another technology use, used called home node B. So instead of using a Wi-Fi access point inside your home, you can use Uh, instead of using Wi-Fi access point inside your home, you can use LTE access point. We call it home network. And what, what, what does this mean? This means that you get the full capacity and full bandwidth and full speed of LTE network inside your home, which is awesome. I mean, better, much better than Wi-Fi, and the service will not be interrupted. So since we have two new technologies, then any new technology you introduce to your system introduces a new security threats. I mean, you have now a relay. Uh, how, how are you gonna assure that this relay is really trusted relay? Is this the relay that uh, that's authentic? How are you gonna authenticate the relay? How are you gonna send your data to the relay securely? All these questions are going to be uh, question are going to be subject to be uh, questioned because uh, those are new concerns that we didn't have in the previous networks. And for the home node network, we also need to consider new security requirements because we have a new entity now in the network and we need to know how to secure it. And the way this is done is similar to WiMAX somehow. We have we have two-way authentication in LTE, just like uh, WiMAX. We have the, I think it uses the same, the same things as WiMAX as well, RSA-based encryption and EPS. And for the encryption they use 
in order to facilitate secure packet exchange between the user equipment and EPC, a so-called devolved packet system and key agreement protocol was proposed for. So there is a key agreement protocol in the LNET, in the LTE network. And this protects against man in the middle attack as well. And it, it, it's similar to WiMAX, it has two-way authentication process, downlink and uplink. And this ensures that uh, the base station cannot be faked and the user cannot be faked. So nobody can come and pretend as if it is the legit user. And not any other base station can come and claim to be the supposed base station that the user should connect to. So this is the security briefly in LTE. 4G, WiMAX, Wi-Fi, and the Bluetooth. Now, what about the security in 5G, 5G networks? How the security is being met there in this network? Before we talk about the security, as I said before, uh, any new technology that comes in with the new features and the new methods, the new algorithm, there are new security risks, risks that can come uh, as a consequence of that. And to understand this, uh, th these technologies, we have this figure here, which, which shows that three main services to be covered and met by 5G, including the enhanced mobile broadband, massive machine type communication, and ultra reliable low latency communication. So at the top here, at the top of the pyramid, we have the enhanced mobile broadband. Example of these, we have the 3D video streaming, UHD screens, and applications like Twitch, like YouTube, like high definition videos, all these applications are going to be served by this service. You have the work and the play in the cloud gaming, gaming like Discord, Discord server, Discord uh, if you are aware of this website, of this app called Discord, all about gaming and multi-user communicating and talking with each other and multiple rooms. So it's, it's, it's like this, this is not efficient right now over a wireless network. So with 5G is going to be more, more, much better than it was before. You have the augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality. And then as you move, uh, as you move to the bottom, you start moving towards applications that care more about reliability and low latency than the, the, the amount of data you transfer. So you have the self-driving cars. The most critical thing here is latency and reliability. That's why when we use when we when we have an application or a service that's related to self-driving car. We want our communication to be low latency and ultra reliable, extremely reliable. And even for mission critical or industry automation, or industry automation inside your uh, factory or whatever, this is so critical. And when you move to the, when you move, so the security requirements here when you go to self-driving car, there is no. There is no tolerance, whatever, to, towards security. You cannot let any hacker attack you or stop your communication because if it stops, you are going to make an accident and this is dangerous. So the security, as you move, move to the bottom here, to this critical ultra reliable and low, the security becomes really dangerous here. You need to be very careful. You can hear you can accept low security for enhanced mobile broadband, but not at all at ultra reliable low latency communication because the services are critical. Like uh, let's say remote surgery operation. A doctor in, in, in Turkey is conducting an operation for a patient in Pakistan, let's say. It's so critical, I mean. It cannot tolerate any latency, any hack, any delay, any security threat. So here, I believe uh, the, the 6G is going to add uh, ultra security here to this service. It's going to be all 
ultra security, ultra reliability, low latency communication, because security cannot be compromised at this level. And we cannot assume that everybody is trustworthy in the network and no hackers will be interested in manipulating this network. So speaking of this, the security at this service is more critical than the security at the services related to enhanced mobile broadband. When we go to massive machine to the other corner of the pyramid, the massive machine type communication, this is basically related to Internet of Things devices that are used for in, in home, in cities, in, uh, in many other applications like tracking, uh, transportation, home, agriculture, industry, education, parking, uh, shopping, whatever. Those are uh, all, all of these are things that can improve uh, the lives of people in a certain city. And this can happen when you use Internet of Things devices. So those devices, they, the, most, the most critical thing for them, usually they don't require high data rates. They, they just send uh, like mess, uh, alarms sometimes, just measurements or notification to your mobile app or something like this. When you are measuring something, when something happens, send me a message. When someone comes to my home and I'm not at home, uh, let me know about him. Let uh, send me a message or let me talk to him remotely. Th these kind of applications. Uh, if someone breaks into my home while I'm uh, asleep, let uh, let me be notified. Uh, let the alarm work and uh, scare the scare the the one who entered or whatever. I mean, those are the services that are used usually for massive machine type communication. And as you can see, all of them are not so critical and so necessary in our life. They are used to improve our life, advance our life, but they are not like so critical. That's why I believe the security at this level can be tolerated and the security at this level cannot be tolerated and here in between. But the point is that now you having understood this diagram, now you can understand where security should be emphasized more and should be uh, given more attention and more importance. Now moving forward and looking at the big picture of 5G and the security threat landscape uh, on smartphones, Internet of Things, cloud and connected world, we have really uh, plenty of attacks, like whether it's on the application layer or the network layer, the physical layer, Mac layer, all of them, you don't, uh, I mean, it's unbelievable the amount of av available attacks, starting from ransomware, malware, spyware, botnets, malicious app, which are mobile apps related to the application or web, you have the cloud malwares and uh, zero days. You have man in the middle attacks on the physical layer. You have distributed denial of service available at all layers. Internet of Things, botnet, zero days, stacknets. You know these stacknets uh, that that destroyed the nuclear the nuclear facilities of Iran. I mean uh, that 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 virus was working without the internet. I mean and was targeted against the, the, not the computers, the PLC devices, the machinery. Imagine uh, you can reach to that level. So even hackers nowadays can shut down the electricity of a country. And this is so scary. So those are critical things that should be considered and should be handled properly. But this is the general picture. And for this, for this, we need to really uh, redesign the security from the bottom up and rethink of it one more time. Because, you know, in 5G, we have introduced some several technologies. And when you introduce such new technologies, you end up you end up in need of a new security algorithms that can defend 
uh, against the attacks that might happen again uh, for these devices or for these technologies that for example you have uh, net uh, you have a new a new services in 5G and the new technologies like um, softwareization and uh, uh, you have network defined radio you have software defined radio you have uh, virtualization network function virtualization and all these things are basically replacing the hardware's functionalities with software programs and you know if you remove the hardware and it was difficult to conduct an attack on it now it would be much easier to conduct a security attack when you have a software because you are moving this functionality to the application layer and at the application layer you have infinity number of attacks infinity number of threats really you can any any even if you if you do something wrong in the code, sometimes the hacker can attack that, can exploit that uh, that point and make your application down. So all in all, any new technology that gets into any new standard needs a new rethinking and uh, introducing a new security algorithm and new security approaches that can defend against uh, the threats and vulnerabilities and the attack that might appear and happen. So thank you everybody. We can stop here and we can continue in the next lecture.